Welcome to Redeeming Missions, a podcast from Every Home for Christ about the complexity of Christian missions and evangelism in our time. We host conversations that will challenge us through unique global perspectives and honest stories. Redeeming Missions is a podcast for ministry leaders, passionate evangelists, and the rest of us who might be a little bit more cautious or even disenchanted with the topic. Together, we're on a journey to find the heart of what it means to carry Christ to our world. I'm your host, Tanner Peak, and I'm so glad you're joining me today. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Redeeming Missions. I'm so excited about the conversation that we have today. I was joined by my old buddy, Corey Asbury. You might know Corey from his award-winning song, Reckless Love or Father's House, or even his new album, Pioneer. Uh, but to me, he's just an old friend that I wanted to talk about uh, what it means to follow Jesus and to love Jesus and to know Jesus in the 21st century. You're gonna say, see, we had a playful conversation uh, about a lot of things, but one of the things that really sticks out to me about the conversation you're about to hear was a conversation around, around what does it mean for Jesus to, to be enough for us? even in the midst of our suffering, on the best days of our lives, or on the hard, hardest days of our lives, uh, where is the presence of Christ to us in all of those circumstances? Uh, Corey is an honest voice. I love that about him. He says the hard thing. He says it, he just says it as it is. And so I think you're gonna walk away from this conversation just super edified, uh, and hopefully it's enjoyable to listen to as well. Redeeming Missions is brought to you by Every Home for Christ, a global network of local catalysts, inspiring and empowering the church to carry Christ to everyone, everywhere, in every generation. We have teams in over 155 nations, partnering with local churches and believers to make sure no one gets left behind or overlooked, because the good news of the gospel is for every person on earth. We're not just doing this for the numbers. We're here for the body of Christ worldwide, and that includes you. Every single believer is uniquely called to carry Christ to our worlds, and it's going to take all of us. Find out more and join us today at everyhome.org. All right, I'm joined here uh, with Corey Asbury. I'm sitting in actually his piano room here. Where the magic happens. That's right, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Um, to just to get to have a conversation a little bit about his life and what uh, energizes Corey and the things that make him excited. So on every one of these podcasts, Corey, we, we do the same thing. We have kind of the same script. We start with uh, really just asking our guests what their, what their story is, get the 10 minute version of what makes Corey Asbury, uh, Corey Asbury. And it's been kind of the trend. What really happens is we, we end up talking about your story and that becomes pretty much the most prominent aspect of the podcast itself. Yeah. So I'm excited to hear Jeez. your story. I know you. We're, we're intimidated we're, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're old friends. And yeah. so it's funny asking you your story. But even this morning, I was thinking about it, how I don't know how you'll respond yeah. to the question about what, you know, what's your yeah. story? Who, who, what yeah. makes you tick? Well, even pre-Colorado, I mean, we met when we were both the ripe old, old age of like, what, like late 20s? Maybe early thirties, early twenties. Early twenties. No, if you go okay, all the way back sheesh. to Kansas City, I mean, you go. That's true. That's true. Probably young. young. It's true. So there's a lot before that, you know. And I, I grew up in the church. Basically, my my parents got saved when I was five years old. And uh, to me, Christianity as a kid it was just a list of rules. It was uh, it was a list of do's and don'ts. You know, that's the way that I understood it. I understood we went to church on Sunday, and then the rest of the week was kind of a free for all. He just did whatever. And uh, it, it was never a personal thing. It was just something that our family did. You know, I would see my mom praying and interceding. You know, I'd, I'd come home as a teenager from some late nights doing some, some different things. And she would be on the couch, like devoutly praying and, and crying her eyes out with her Bible open. And honestly, it never made sense to me. Like, I, I just didn't, I didn't get it. It didn't, it didn't hit home, you know. Because again, the idea of going to church or Christianity was just a religion. It was just something, a set of beliefs that you kind of adhere to. You try to do your best. And if you do really good, one day, maybe you make it to heaven. And if you don't do good, you probably go to hell. That was sort of my assessment of life as a quote unquote Christian. 
And uh, it wasn't until probably my early teen years, I started leading worship. No. At my, yeah, at my church. I was 13 years old. My voice hadn't changed yet. I sounded like, you know, I sounded like 10 year old Justin Bieber up there trying to sing like, did you feel the, did you feel the mountain? It was bad. It was not good. All my friends made a lot of fun of me. But you're playing guitar as well? I was playing guitar. I was learning guitar. I was learning electric guitar. So nice. I was actually playing electric guitar on like the main worship team, you know? And then uh, for youth, I was leading worship. I was just a young kid. I was 13 years old. I had no idea. Again, I had no grid for what worship was what what made you want to do that then i mean what what, what, what there was, was something it about? yeah there was something in me that just loved it like i came alive when i did it i remember i listened to the first it was on a it was on a cassette recording of me list, leading worship on sunday morning and i had full body chills and i didn't understand why because again it wasn't like oh me and jesus are real tight like we hang out a lot i read the bible and like right. we talk it was like I go to school and I don't tell anyone I'm a Christian because I'm doing a lot of bad things on the weekend kind of thing. But when I played and sang, something happened and, and something wow. inside of me just just came alive. And so I started leading worship. But again, I, I had no grid for it. I didn't understand what was going on. And a lot of times, if I'm really honest with you, I would show up on those Sunday mornings to play electric guitar and I was high as a kite. I was still drunk from the night before. Wow. I was still a wreck from, you know, the parties and stuff that we were. This is like as a 14, 15 year old kid. I got in with the with the wrong crowd real quick when I got into high school. I hung out with all seniors. And uh, but I knew that there was something that took place when I played and sang. Um, so I didn't know what to do with that. You know, there was just huh. something in me that was like, OK, there's something here. You know, there's something to this. And I just started writing songs. But they were never like Jesus songs. They were like, I broke up with my girlfriend <laughs> and I'm trying to process out on the back porch, you know. Really profound, very, deep, really, really, very, really deep stuff. Um, <laughs> I wish I had some of those old songs, man. They, they would be hilarious to listen to. They're probably decent, but like hilarious. Um, so I was writing songs. I was, I was processing life through songwriting it was sort of my my therapy sort of my mm -hmm. way to deal with the various traumas that i was experiencing as a kid and and my home life was not easy uh it was it was really tough actually my relationship with my mom was fine we weren't close but it was fine but my relationship with my dad especially as a teenager was really really strained um mm. we didn't get along he was a by all accounts, he was a very harsh man at that time, really stressed out by life. And, and I, now that I'm older, I kind of get it. But man, he was just stressed out. He'd come home from work, pissed off, yelling and screaming, a lot of things that we shouldn't have heard as kids. Um, we heard there weren't a whole lot of I love you's and I'm proud of you's to go around. It was just hmm. it was a lot of intensity in our home. And I remember my mom and dad getting in fights and, you know, even 15, 16 years old. I had to step in between them as they were screaming at, you know, mostly my dad screaming mm. at my mom. And I was like, stop, you know, and there are probably a few choice words in there from, from all of us. Um, but it, it caused me to grow up really fast. I think, mm. um, caused me to become an adult quicker than I should have, you know, at, at 15, 16 years old, you should still be chilling with your homies, like kind of having a, a mm -hmm. kind of easier life rather than navigating the struggles of how to make sure your parents don't, you know, break up kind of thing. Um, so that that definitely informed a lot of my songwriting at the time. It definitely, um, it made me a really emotional kid, honestly. Hmm. I was very like, uh, you know, sad emo boy, like with his guitar <laughs> singing about, you know, how, how hard Corey it is. Corey Asbury, sad, sad emo, emo guy. guy. <laughs> I, need to, I need to come out with a record. That could be your next record, man. Sad, sad emo music. I that's, want a little bit of credit, though. Yeah, okay. that's out. basically what Pioneer is. <laughs> <laughs> but dude, there, there was a lot of that growing up. And, and in the midst of that, I still, again, didn't have what I think most of us would call like relationship with Jesus, right? I had an understanding of the things that I should and shouldn't do. But I had not met God. That, mm -hmm. That's the way that I would explain it. And um, I moved after high school to Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm from North Carolina, grew up in North Carolina, but moved a couple cities over to live with my best friend after high school, which we were absolute hooligans. It was the worst choice by all uh, measures. 
we were doing lots of bad stuff. And um, my mom called me one day and was just like, hey, I heard about this place. And she, she described it as a music school, a place where I could go to learn how to sing and, and write songs and get better at it. Because she knew I was passionate about it. Like I said, you know, she saw something yeah. in me with that and from a young age she would always prophesy over me she'd be like you're a levite you're supposed to be in the house of god wow. so she tells me about this place where i can grow as a musician and a singer and i'm like that sounds cool but like i'm kind of living it up with my boy out here in raleigh north carolina she's like you know if you do this your dad and i will pay for it and it was like five six grand something like that i had no money at the time and uh, she's like at least apply you know so I went online and I did the application thing and much to my surprise, they called back about a month later and were like, hey, you're in the program. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, I'm kind of scared. Like, like oh, I don't want to go. What have I done? Yeah. Like, I, what have I got myself into? Uh, I did this kind of to appease my mom and dad to say, hey, yeah. you know, I'll try to get my life together, but I'm not really going to. And uh, end up going out there. I don't have my license because I've gotten too many speeding tickets. Again, like I was, an, I was not a good kid. Too many speeding tickets and too many accidents, and they revoke my license. So I don't have you a didn't license. You didn't have a driver's license. No, I didn't have a driver's license. My car got impounded, <laughs> and so my mom had to drive me from North Carolina to Kansas City. Uh, that's where this quote-unquote music school was, and we went out there, and uh, I quickly realized this was not a music school, you know, like you were <laughs> there, bait and you switch, know, not a music school. major bait and switch, uh, got there and it's like a full on prayer room, you know, like, and for those of you who don't, don't know what a prayer room is, is like, basically you go in this room, there's live music, you sit with your Bible open and you just try to like connect with God for like hours and hours. And that was very foreign to me. I hated this. And the first day we went, they called it, uh, the day of consecration, which is a very <laughs> scary term. Um, terrifying really. I know I didn't like it we get in there and it's literally 10 hours straight the first day no food no water you're fasting and you got your bible open <laughs> and I was like dude I'm gonna kill myself like straight up I'm done like this is I'm, you're like I I'm cannot done. do this yeah I gotta find a way out you know I can't do this and I knew I was in for a really tough time because again I didn't have a way to leave I didn't have a license I didn't have a car so wow. I was like I, had, oh God, I didn't know this for your what story am I at gonna all do you know and I hated it for the first three months. Just absolutely hated this place <clears throat> because it wasn't what I thought, you know. Three months in, this is where I actually like, I feel like I met God for the first time. And this dude named Corey Russell is preaching this class. Um, he called it burn class. It's basically where he comes in and just goes off with everything that's on his heart. <laughs> for good or bad, you know, for better or worse. And mostly good. Mostly good. And he's a wild man. And he's, he's really... Uh, 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 an amazing man of God. So he comes in, he's teaching this class. I'm not paying attention at all. I have no idea what the guy's talking about. None. Probably thinking about all the girls in the internship that I want to kiss, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so he's like preaching his thing. And all of a sudden he just goes, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And I was, I kind of just perked up. I was like, okay, cool. Felt something shift in the room. And uh, all of a sudden, I mean, I'm just like, and, and this is widespread. It's happening like around the whole kind of class. There's like 60 ish students. Everyone's just crying their eyes out. Just like, just like weeping and wailing. Like wow. you read about in the old Testament when like their kids died and stuff. And it was like, it was super intense. Cause I'd not really experienced the presence of God really before that. Like I said, I've been to church, uh, but I've not felt it. So boom, we're, we're in it. I'm crying my eyes out. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, bro, I start kind of trying to talk to God, like, what's happening? What is going on? I don't know what I'm feeling. And he's like, uh, he says two things that were really, really clear to me. And it wasn't like audible voice, but it was like in my self. I don't know how to explain yeah. that, you know? Yeah. Um, and he, he was like, first of all, I've seen everything that you've done. And I was like, oh, <laughs> 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 this is a good, like, this is a bad thing. Um, Cause I've mo done mostly bad things. And I was kind of like, oh, dang, this, this isn't good kind of thing. It was like the, the fear of the Lord, but probably a little bit more scared than probably the fear of the Lord should have been. Um, but it was a recognition that he knew all of the stuff that I'd ever done, you know? Like God was real, basically. Yeah. And he's seen it. And then the second thing, and he, was, he just goes, and I still want you. And I was like, 
boom, done. Wow. And and that's when it became real to me it was because it was like my whole life I didn't, I didn't really believe that God was real, honestly. And like if I'm very vulnerable to to the point of like you know getting myself in trouble, honesty. I didn't think he was real. I just thought there was this idea. It was a set of rules. Yeah. You know, it, it was kind of like, you know, Buddhism or whatever other religion. You're, yeah. you're abiding by a, you know, moral code or whatever. And, and hopefully that makes you a better person. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm experiencing something that I can't deny. And later I would go on to read, you know, Paul in Ephesians talking about, you know, I pray that you would experience the length, width, yeah. depth. You know, he's talking about something that passes this this dome piece of ours you know <laughs> he's talking about something that you feel um and i felt it for the first time and i was like dang you know all the bad stuff that i did and you still like me like you still want me around mm. that's that's a crazy thought and that began to change my life and i fell in love with worship from that place um, because again i already love singing and playing i love wow. writing songs and all of a sudden i found a place where i could meet with god um through that that medium that I already uh, loved, so I don't know, man. That's that's a lot of it. S say more about <laughs> that moment. I mean, yeah. the two things. Like yeah. I've seen everything you've done, mm -hmm. and I want you. Yeah. Tell me, say more about the I want you part yeah. of that. I mean, if if I'm looking at someone, if I'm God, and I'm looking down at humans. And I see all the dumb stuff that they're doing. I'm like, I'm sending another flood. Right. That, that's me. Like, that's my humanity. <laughs> that's the Corey. Corey that's the Corey, Corey version Corey of the Bible. God. Like the Bible ends in whatever verse the flood happens. You know, <laughs> that's my version. And, and then I look at a God who's perfect, holy, all these things that I learned growing up. And he looks at me how incredibly stupid I am. Like I knew what my life was. Right. Like I was well acquainted with what I was doing on an in and out regular basis. And he goes, hey, but I get it. And I still want you close to me. That, yeah. that doesn't throw me off. That doesn't, I'm not worried about it. I'm not scared by it. I'm not intimidated by how much of a quote unquote failure you are. Um, I still like you. And it's even more than love. Like, it's kind of like when you're a parent, you got to love your kid. Right. Right. Like, sometimes I don't like my kid, though, to be really honest with you. I'm like, oh, you're annoying the crap out of me kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but God looks at us and our little weird little things that we do and idiosyncrasies and the things that kind of make us us. And he goes, no, I like I like you. I like what I made. And I want you to be near me. Um, that for me was like, that's all I needed. You know, because I felt rejection my whole life. I felt like my dad was always pissed yeah, off at me. Yeah. My, you know, I was not big enough, fast enough, strong enough, good enough, smart enough, whatever enough you can think of. I wasn't enough for my own, my own dad, you know. And so I looked at God and I was like, I, he must feel the same. You know, he must be annoyed with me just like my dad is, you know. I'm not, I'm not cool enough. I'm not this enough. And, and the father's like, hey, I'm not like that. Like, mm. you're big enough, you're strong enough, you're fast enough, you're smart enough, you're mm. whatever enough. And I made you and I like you and I want you to be close. That was it, man. I was like, okay, I'm in. You like me? I'm, I'm all right, cool. Let's do I it. think for so many people, our salvation or our, our walk with Jesus is really that simple. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, there's all the complexities of theology. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be a understand systematic theology. You could understand Paul, mm -hmm. the New Testament. You can know mm -hmm. the synoptic gospels. I mean, you can know it all. You can have all this knowledge. Yeah. But for so many people, myself included, that there's a moment where we realize that he, he wants me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's so profound, even in light of how you told your story and about growing up too quickly and just the way that your, you know, your adolescence played out especially mm -hmm. with your parents or with your dad specifically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that that message i want you i see everything that you've done and i want you that's yeah. incredibly profound yeah i think for most people eight billion people on the planet today that's all anyone needs to hear that's that's the fundamental message yeah. is i you know i want you yeah. or i see you and i want you yeah i think it's totally. so profound yeah you just came out with an album mm -hmm. pioneer just about 
couple of weeks pioneering, ago. Pioneering, yeah. It's just, <laughs> just about pioneering, it's, just, it's, it's about pioneering. <laughs> no, I love it. It's probably my favorite album that you've done. I mean, yeah. you know that I've shot you text yeah. um, as the songs were released. He uh, doesn't actually have my number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, You're right. I, I text you <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. numerous times uh, <laughs> over the course, you know, the last month or two as, as the songs have come out. And there were numerous songs on this album that for me personally, um, up early in the morning, spending my time yeah. uh, by myself <clears throat> for the Lord. And there were multiple songs in this album that I would find myself just weeping mm. and crying. And I think mm. what I love about this album to me personally, I'm, t I'm, I'm using my own, this is my own little, yeah. little moment to endorse, I think the music <laughs> that you're building. I love the honesty. Yeah. Um, I, love, I love that about you just generally. Yeah. Um, the way that you're, that you, I don't know, you're just true to yourself, you're true to your story and you don't allow yourself to be whipped around by the, the trends or the, the, maybe the opinions of our time. Yeah. But this album seems to particularly speak to pain mm. in a way that I think is really profound. Some of the most, mm -hmm. um, just deeply, deeply impacting yeah. um, music. But, but one of the songs on there is my, probably my favorite one. Um, it was the song only Jesus for my pain. Yeah. Um, if it's okay and it's not, it's going to be super awkward. I want to read yeah. a couple of the lyrics and then I'm going to ask yeah, you what sure. the song means to you. But sure. so only Jesus for my pain. I, I must have tried most everything. It ended all the same for good and bad. I realized only Jesus for my pain mm. designer jeans and pretty things. In the end they fade. It took the dust to realize only Jesus for my pain. Yeah. Only Jesus knows the questions, the things I'm scared to say. Only Jesus holds the answers to the troubles I can't face. And every single road I take leads back to this place. Only Jesus for my pain. Mm. Can you say mm. a little bit more about this beautiful song yeah. and what it, what it would mean for someone maybe who's listening to this, who's feeling experiencing pain yeah. and they're hearing a little bit of your story and they're hearing Corey encountered God in a way that he knew he belonged. Yeah. What would this song mean to them? And how does Jesus meet us in the place of our pain? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it, it came from a, a very honest place because I, I've dealt with chronic back pain since I was 21 years old and I'm 37 now. So it's been a bit, you know, and it gets better and it gets worse. Um, there are times that I'm like, oh, I'm I'm good. And then there are days like oh, I can't walk, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, so kinda, you have real genuine, I mean, obviously yeah, physical plan but that you have suffering in your life. Yeah. And, I, and I've journeyed with, with Jesus through all of it, you know, and, and there have been times that I've been really frustrated, you know, like having a little boy and I can't even like run around with him. You know, you want to wrestle and it, it's like, I can't right now, buddy. It's that kind of thing. Um, and there's been times where I'm like, no, no, I'm cool. I get it. This is like a thorn in the flesh. Paul kind of deal where he's like, man, could you take this? And God's like, nah, you good. Like, why don't you keep that, bud? Um, so sometimes I'm content with it, but I think, I think wrestling constantly with the issue of why am I not better? And those whys, they come up a lot, you know, cause you want to understand, Hey, is this good for me? Like, is this helpful? Like, explain this to me, God. Like, why, why is this still happening? Um, and I think the ultimate conclusion for me, which came kind of in this song, and I'm sure I'll still waffle and wrestle and, you know, deal with, um, with thoughts that are uncertain concerning. So I don't necessarily mean ultimate as in yeah. I've settled the issue and I'm perfectly holy now. Like, yeah. I mean, like I came to a, a, a real kind of revelatory conclusion that Jesus was speaking to me through a very specific instance that I won't get into right now, but whether I'm healed on this side of time or not, the answer still is only Jesus for my pain. And, and if I'm not, mm. the answer is I'm with him in the garden, mm. you know, right before he's about to go to the cross, dude, sweat and blood, you know, like he's so, anxious and and freaked out about what he's about to do right. meaning jesus and and i can find myself i can picture myself obviously it's not quite as uh, glorious as he was about to do but i can picture myself with him in that moment going i hate this this sucks if there's any way to take this please and then the father's like nah like this is this is yours to do right now 
And I could find myself there. And there's solace in that. Like only Jesus for my pain, whether it gets better or not. And if it does get healed and, and I miraculously just can never experience pain again, and I can run fully and do all the things that I want to do, then only Jesus for my pain. It had nothing to do with anything else. Um, but I, my, my wife actually dealt with like really intense anxiety mm-hmm. um, for, for a little season there. And I've never experienced that. Like, I would say the way that I experience like anxiety is in my body. So like if I'm stressed out, it's manifesting in my body. It, my mind is clear. Um, but with my wife, she, her mind was really sort of uh, troubled with, with anxious thoughts. And I had this moment with God where I was experiencing intense anxiety for the first time ever because of something that I tried to heal my pain. And I understood my wife for the first time. And I was like, oh, you know how we feel. Like Jesus is the high priest, right? Like he knows how we feel. He's experienced it before. He he gets it. He can sympathize. Um, I don't know, man. I, I think whether we get fixed on this side or not, the answer is still Jesus. He's with us in the middle of it. And he wants to be with us in the middle of the pain. He wants us to invite us into the middle of the more, more difficult parts of the story. And uh, that's an answer in and of itself. It might not be the answer that we want, but he's right there with us and he's walking with us in it. So I hear you saying, that's, I mean, your answer is so beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I hear you saying though, something really, really profound. And I think it, it probably would resonate with most people that are listening to this, that there are things in our lives that are just pain. There's suffering and there's pain and that we don't, we don't always get the healing or the breakthrough yeah. that we're praying for. Totally. Um, our, we don't get the job that we wanted. We don't get um, the diagnosis that we wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, you were just referencing um, your wife's, you know, her, 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 her challenge and her struggle wrestling with anxiety and even yours mm-hmm. uh, to some extent. There's these things in our lives that are just pain and, they, and we struggle. Mm-hmm. And I think what I, I hear you saying is that you have a belief that God still meets us in those places, but it's not always the way yeah. that we hope it would be, but it's still Jesus. Like he's, mm-hmm. he's still present on the darkest nights yeah. of our life. Yeah. Say more a little bit more about what it's meant for you personally, for Jesus to meet you at the darkest nights of your life. Yeah, I think those are the most important times um, in our faith, our relationship with God. It's easy to be like, oh, life is good, awesome, amazing, thumbs up, everything's happy. I feel like those are the times when we're like, I don't really need God. It's all good. And uh, the difficult times in my life personally, you know, I I don't know y'all listening or you, Tanner, like those are the times that I've grown the most. And those are the times that I've matured the most because I think he allows certain things um, for us to experience that are actually going to help us, even though it feels like it hurts us. And, you know, I'll probably get labeled a a heretic for this, but like Richard Rohr has a, has a, um, a book called everything belongs. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a song on pioneer basically straight out of that book. But the idea is it's basically Romans eight, you know, where he's talking about, he actually works all things for good. Right. If we believed that James one, uh, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Yeah. And patience does all this other stuff that he talks about, right? If we bought into that theologically, our lives would be a lot easier. Because then we can navigate valleys the same way that we could navigate mountaintops. You know, because we know that God's doing something special and important in our lives, whether it feels good or not. And the truth is, like you said, it doesn't often feel good when, right. when you're experiencing a diagnosis that you didn't want, when you're experiencing, uh, maybe it's the loss of a child. Yeah. Like there's stuff that happens in life that's really, really difficult. And there's no way to navigate it without going, God, I need you here with me to experience the difficulty of this. Not necessarily to heal me or to fix right. me, but I need someone here with me to know I'm not alone and someone's walking with me through this. So I think those moments are where we grow the most. Like I can look at my own life to 
very specific moments in our uh, in our marriage, in our kids' lives. Like when we almost we almost lost Lily, our nine year old, when we were in Colorado. A number of times she stopped breathing and had to be put on the that's table. Right. Yeah, that's right. The whole deal and and that brought up so much in my heart. Like it was God's kindness to go. Hey, I'm allowing this to happen because you actually have all these fault lines in your heart where you believe that I'm mean, vindictive, vindictive, um, angry, spiteful, and I'm doing this to you because you've done something wrong. Right. That's a wrong paradigm. And God's like, I want to root that out. And I'm going to use a difficult situation to do it. And so I went, God, I think you're mean when Lily almost died. Like, I think yeah. you're mean and angry. And I've never really said that before, but that's how I feel. And he was like, okay, thanks for saying that. Now let me show you my goodness in the middle of this thing. And that was a very, like, that was a massive time. Like the song Reckless Love kind of came from that, where God was just writing some some wrong ideas in my heart. And, you know, Tozer is like, the thing that you believe about God is the most important thing about About you. you. Yeah. And I believe that's true. The way that we perceive and experience who God is will literally determine the rest of our outlook on life and our perspective. And if you believe God is good and he has your goodness in in kind of the final end game in his eternal mind or heart or whatever, then everything does belong. The good, the bad, the happy, sad, all of it. He uses it. And the truth is heartbreak often writes the songs. It's the difficult things in life that we experience that bring forth fruit in our lives. And none of us want to say that because it sucks when you're going through it. Yeah. It's really hard to go, count it all joy, this is amazing. You know, I almost lost my child. Like, yeah. it's really difficult. <clears throat> um, but if we can have that perspective, I think it does, it, it changes everything and helps us navigate the things that we experience in a better way. I think jumping off what you were saying about Tozer, Mm-hmm. You know, when he said what we think about ourselves, or what we think about, I'm sorry, what we think about God about is the most God. important and thing about and, and, and myself <laughs> and is the most important thing, you know, about me. Yeah. It's going to dictate all of my life. Mm-hmm. This, this, this podcast is dedicated to conversations really around the idea of missions. Mm-hmm. And I think just like we're talking about this Tozer quote, and we're saying what we think about God um, has this, uh, this impact on the, w- the way that we are, the way that we navigate the mm-hmm. goods, the bads, the mm-hmm. ugly, the beautiful. Mm-hmm. It impacts everything. I would say the same thing when it comes to missions, mm-hmm. that, that our paradigm of God is fundamental to the way that we exhibit Christ yeah. to the world around us. And I think we were talking about this just last night, mm-hmm. how many times that missions has such a negative connotation mm-hmm. to so many people. Mm-hmm. And in part, what I'm curious about is if some of the some of the pain that people have experienced from missions, or some of the confusion that they've mm-hmm. experienced around that, mm-hmm. is coming from these paradigms of God um, that maybe don't they don't have room for a God who experiences pain, mm-hmm. or that or allows us to experience pain, mm-hmm. or they there's you know missionaries or evangelists that don't have room. Uh, in their hearts or in their lives to come to people where they're actually at mm-hmm. um, because they have this view of God who's harsh or vindictive. Mm-hmm. Um, missions is not, by and large, a popular topic. Um, we were talking about this, joking about this last <laughs> night. This is not a thing. We're not looking, I'm not looking for um, <clears throat> some kind of big platform by talking about missions and, yeah. and tr- even trying to redeem this concept or broaden the aperture of this concept. Mm-hmm. But when you think of missions, and Corey Asbury, honest, you know, upfront Corey Asbury thinks, thinks of missions. What do you think is the disconnect? You know, what, what do you think it is that for the average person, when they hear that word, there's this kind of a step back. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think is going on uh, when pe- when, with yeah. people's perception of mission? I try to be as kind as possible. Be kind. Uh, you know, be honest, though. I want the, you to be honest. As yeah, well. no, the, the westernized version of missions, I think, is probably not super maybe what it was supposed to be you know the westernized version of missions to me is like send your 14 year old over to like you know the philippines and it's basically a glorified vacation essentially and the beauty of that is oftentimes as was my experience when i went over there yeah i actually encountered god in a way that i needed to i probably didn't do great work for the the country (laughs) of the philippines you know 
Um, but it was important for me, self-discovery and self-expression and, and sort of meeting God in that way and realizing I'm not the only person on the face of this planet. Yeah. You know, that, that was helpful. But I think we've reduced it to that in a lot of ways, to sort of a glorified vacation or a little trip that our teenagers take and we send them from our churches. And, and you know, it's kind of annoying also because all those kids are always asking for money. They're like, hey, I need, you know, $5,000 to go over to Philippines. Can you blah, blah, blah. And it's almost like when the solicitor's knocking on your door, talking about like, hey, do you want to buy these Girl Scout cookies? Right. And the truth is you don't want to, but you feel bad for them because, you know, they need to raise money right. for the Girl Scouts. And you're like, right. all right, here's five bucks. Give me the friggin' Thin Mints, you know? <laughs> um, Overpriced Thin Mints. <laughs> five bucks is probably not accurate. It's probably 25. Yeah, it's, probably, it's a lot. Um, but But I think we've so sort of hurt the idea of what, what missions is supposed to be with our Western culture that's made it a thing that is probably not. Yeah. Um, and I think it's frustrating to people because of that, because of what we've molded it into, mostly here in America. Um, people have a bad taste in their mouth, I think, because of that. But when you see how beautiful it can be and some of the stories that come from it, you're like, oh, wait, there's there's value in this and and there's something really special that takes place and i think of the scripture um you know talks about the angels rejoicing in heaven there's a party in heaven when one person yeah. comes into the kingdom like that's pretty uh you know descriptive language to show how exciting it is to jesus when someone actually walks into the kingdom and someone accepts jesus right. like there's something pretty special to that so I don't know how we restore sort of the the glory that should be there with missions, but the, the, honestly, the way that I think about it, and this is probably not super helpful to you know EHC's point, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, my neighbors, yeah, like, like I have to be missional with my neighbors, and that often looks like first just loving them, showing them kindness. Um, not being a jerk when I see them on the street and yeah. putting my head down and, yeah. you know, I don't want to talk to you kind of thing, but engaging in conversation. Hey, how are you? How's your life? What do you do? Like, how are your kids? Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden, a couple months down the road, you're able to have meaningful conversations with that person because you simply showed them kindness. To me, like, that's that's actually really important. And that's the way I try to live my life when go to 7-Eleven and I get gas. You know, I try to walk into the place, look that person who's working the, the cash register in the eyes, acknowledge them as a human being, give them dignity. That's so good. Show kindness. You know, maybe even a quick, how are you doing, man? You good? And they might be like, oh, yeah. But they're like, wait a sec, someone, someone gave a crap about me today? And I think if we could take that approach, maybe, to the nations, I don't know what that looks like necessarily, but it's it's very not me focused. It's very not about uh, yeah. me finding gratification or me going on some cool little vacation over to like right. the Maldives or however you say that. How do you say it? Maldives. Maldives. Sorry. <laughs> Close, man. I'm bad at geography. Yeah, you know, whatever. I'm surprised you even knew that country. Yeah, no, so I know. Well done. I know. You know, it's, it's, but it's not about me when I go there. It's about these people who do need to hear the beauty and the love of Jesus. Yeah. Just like I talked about earlier, they need to know that God wants them and then they can yeah. belong in this story. And, you know, I think, I think that's part of what's cool about the way that you're doing, at least the way you're explaining it to me last night. Like we got people on the ground in these countries that care about their people, yeah. that care about the people that wear the same color skin as them, that believe the same things as them. And they yeah. want them to know the love of Jesus. There's no selfishness in that. There's no, um, you know, sort of uh, being wrapped up in how cool I can appear when I go and do this thing or I speak at this thing. Yeah. It's not about that. It's just about, hey, this is a people group that I love because I come from it and I want them to experience what I've experienced. That's the way that I feel when I walk down the road. Yeah. These are the people that live in Nashville, Tennessee, that I would love for them to know how I feel. Yeah. How I've experienced God. Um, so I don't know, man, like that's a long winded answer, but no, I think you've described so many things so beautifully. I think 
sometimes we've made missions so grandiose. Mm. It's like we've made it so complex and yeah. so big that I've got to go to the Philippines. <laughs> you know, I've got to go raise money for yeah. it. I've got to... Or like the 40, what do we call it? The 3010, the 4010 window? 1040 40 window. window. Yeah. 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 I can only go to the 1040 window. I've got to go to these different people. And yeah. there's probably a place for all of that. We were we were joking last yeah. night. I, I actually, my own life, I... I was saved on a yeah. mission strip. Yeah. And it sounds like you've been impacted on them as well. So it's mm-hmm. not to be negative about that. No. But maybe the negative byproduct though of this kind of grandiose view of missions is that sometimes we've made it so inaccessible yeah. and so weird to the <laughs> average person. What you just described totally. when you said, hey, I, I just want to go you know, I have the same color skin or I, I'm, I live in the same zip code, yeah. you know, the same, we have the same weather and I just want to go out and show love to mm-hmm. people wherever they're at, mm-hmm. whatever they're like. And mm-hmm. I want to do it through my character and through my words, through the giving of my attention. When you talk yeah. like that, I mean, I think you're, you're getting back to the heart, the, the core of really what missions is all about. Mm-hmm. It's, it's giving the gift of the presence of Christ yeah. to those to, to, to those around us. I mean, we were having, just having a conversation about where Jesus meets us in our pain. Mm-hmm. And one of the, my big takeaways from this conversation and, and just from your words is that Jesus meets us with his presence mm-hmm. in the midst of our pain. Mm-hmm. Missions is just turning that around and saying, yeah. we're going to give our presence in the way that Christ gives his presence to us, yeah. to people and to the world in the midst of their pain. Yeah. And that's so profound. That's such a profound um, totally. understanding of missions and so much more accessible totally. to the everyday person. Totally. You don't realize like just on that point of, of pain, I think we often don't realize how much people are dealing with yeah. on a daily basis and a simple how are you? And then, and maybe it progresses to a, dude, you mind if I just encourage you and pray for you a sec? Most people are wrecked by that. Yeah. That, that simple expression, it's, it's not that grandiose. Like you said, it's not that big. Complex. It's not produced. It's not, there's no smoke and mirrors to it. You don't need to no training lights. to go do this. No, bro. It just, it's so, it's so interesting because people are so broken. It's the truth that as soon as you show a sliver of, care and concern for who they are and what they're dealing with and where they come from it's like they they crack wide open and they're like oh my gosh right like dang wait a sec you like care enough to say a 20 second prayer for me like who are you you know that that to me does so much more than and i'm not dogging on like big conferences or anything like that like i I dig big conferences i've done them for years and i think great impact takes place but man is something so special to when a broken person meets the kindness of Jesus through the simplicity of just an act of service. Uh, bro, how, how are you, man? You good? You know? And all of a sudden, boom, they're wide open and you're like, wait a sec. God wanted to speak into this person's life? Like, I, I felt so weak and I felt so, you know, insignificant going up to this person to talk to them and I felt insecure and all these things and they're just... People are so broken and so waiting for that moment, whether they're here or the Maldives. Is that right? Maldives? Yeah, Maldives. 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 You know, it's, it, they're the same people. That's uh, right. We need Jesus. What about, okay, so we've been talking about pain. We've been talking about missions. I know you spent a lot of your year, the last years, you've spent on, on tours, mm-hmm. on stages, playing music. Um, trying to bring Christ to people where they're at through mm-hmm. through your music, mm-hmm. your honest, uh, I think, good self-reflective music. Um, if you had a a single life message, you know, a, a through line in mm-hmm. your story that you could give to people, what do you know what that would be? Yeah, I, I think it's what we've been talking about. It's kindness. Uh, I always say, like to my family, at least, a legacy of kindness that. You know, they, my family sees me at my worst. My family sees me when I'm screaming and yelling over spilled milk, you know. Yeah. But what I grew up with was such anger at times and such vitriol from, from my own parents, from my own dad. And I, I looked at that and I processed with God and, and really talked to Jesus about it and was like, I would love to leave a legacy that was different than that. You know, I would love to 
show my kids what gentleness looks like because I didn't really experience that as a kid. And, you know, when I was younger, I was really working through a lot of that and trying to do the hard work in my heart and my spirit to be able to walk in those things that I'm talking about. And I can recall, like, literally the, the, the phrase, like, don't cry over spilled milk. Gabriel would, like, be trying to pour some cereal and spill it. And I'd be like, how could you? You know, like, so I've, I've frustrated. I've never done that. I'm a perfect dad. I've never done that. I can't believe you've done uh, that. Praise God. Praise God for you, brother. Bless you, brother. Uh, yeah, but, like, I, I would... I'd all of a sudden take a step back and go, wait a sec, what am I doing? I'm doing exactly what my dad would have done. Like, Jesus, heal me, help me, you know? And I can honestly say, as I've gotten older, I've been, you know, really growing in kindness, gentleness, tenderness. And it starts with my family, and then it's, a, it's an outworking to the world after that. Um, but that, that would be, you know, the catchphrase or the, the motto, like, just the kindness of Jesus, yeah. uh, a legacy of kindness to my family and hopefully to people that I work with. Like we did a we did a music video two days ago, and I think a lot of people on set expected me to come on and be just a total Turk. jerk. Yeah. yeah, you know because that's often the perception of quote unquote like cool people or like an artist or like a, a singer or something. They expect them to come on set and wreak havoc and yell at people and be mad. And I wanted to come on set and be like, you guys are doing amazing. Yeah. And encourage the actor and bro, like, you're so in this, man. Thank you for doing this. And I think that type of thing has such an impact on people that that we could I could never know what that did. And maybe it didn't do anything down the road, but I'm committed to live my life in a way that honors people and and gives dignity to people because I look at the life of Jesus and I'm like he was amazing you know like he walked with these people on earth that were absolute idiots like me you know the whether it's the the woman caught in adultery and I'm sure there was also a man caught in adultery there too but we don't talk about him for whatever reason we can get into that later yeah different, um, different podcast. yeah it's weird uh you know we're talking about the tax collectors we're talking about the sinners we're talking about the folks that were unclean you know the lepers and and Jesus would walk right up to them and you know I imagine like hey how are you I see you you know and I think that's you know, that's that's what life is about. Um, and we, a lot of folks want to have their big stages and their their numbers and their streams if you're a musician or, you know, their sales if they're a whatever, I don't know. And I'm like, man, I just don't think, I don't think that's going to matter, you know? And I think we understand that. And it's hard to live that. Um, so, yeah, just hopefully being nice to people in the name of Jesus. And, and it changed in folks' perceptions of who Christians are and who, who believers are and hopefully, you know, who I am as well. Just showing kindness and let God do something with it. It's so, it's so, so good. This is my last, I have one final question okay. for you. It's just, this is a softball over the plate, so I think <laughs> it's going to be easy. Um, it's been probably a year now or, or maybe even a little bit more. I was walking through a checkout counter and I saw this magazine of Mother Teresa, and mm. it was like a time, one of those special edition versions, you know, yeah. of time. And it was on Mother Teresa. I have no clue. I'm so impulsive just generally, but I have no clue. I just grabbed it, threw yeah. it, you know, threw it on the, uh, you know, and with the rest of my groceries mm -hmm. and, and bought it. And the next morning was up early in my quiet time with God and reading about the life of this beautiful saint, mm -hmm. you know, that has mm -hmm. given so much to so many people and to the marginalized. And, mm -hmm. but there was a term that she used to describe what she did mm -hmm. and the way that she was felt like she was, uh, her mission, her personal mission mm -hmm. that God had given her her personal calling. And she utilized the language of carrying Christ, that mm. she felt like her call was to carry Christ mm -hmm. uh, to the marginalized or to yeah. those on the outskirts of society. But what really uh, has come come with me or has really stuck deeply with me mm -hmm. is this idea to carry, to carry Christ. In fact, at Every Home for Christ, we're using this language everywhere mm -hmm. uh, because it's mm -hmm. such vivid, it has such a vivid 
um, the imagery mm -hmm. around the mm -hmm. idea of carrying Christ. Yeah. What does carrying Christ mean to you? For Corey mm -hmm. Asbury today in 2023, when mm -hmm. I say that term, what comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the practicals that we've talked about, you know, just, just very practically being actually nice to people um, and not hateful, <laughs> which it should go without saying, but for some reason in our day and age in Christianity, it doesn't. Um, I think musically, it's, um, it's helping people feel understood um, because again, like we talked about earlier, like he is the great high priest is what scripture calls him and says he can sympathize with, with the things that we experience. And I think we're all looking for a place to feel understood. We're all looking for a place to belong, feel like we, we actually, you know, are part of something. And so in, in writing music, I, I want to carry the heart of Jesus in every lyric that says you're loved you're seen, you're appreciated, um, you're human and, and flawed and broken and all of those things that come with being human that, that you and I have experienced and every listener has experienced. Um, but you're loved in that place, you're seen in that place. So a lot of it for me is, is uh, musical. Like I tried to yeah. put that in every song, um, in every lyric and, and make sure that the message that's going out is carrying Christ, is um, expressing the way that he feels about people yeah. no matter what. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of as, as simple as that. Show it practically when I'm out um, and then carry it in the music and the message. And, and, and your hope, lyrics. In the lyric and, and hope to God that, you know, it, it hits people and it reaches people. And it's wonderful when you hear stories or you like you text me like bro i'm just getting wrecked by the song this morning god's meeting me in that and i'm like okay cool like yeah. mission accomplished that's that's carrying christ that's um carrying the message that that i think he would have spoken to people nowadays um and it's, it's very not mean or angry or judgmental or freaking out about their sin even um it's just hey i see where you're at i get it not saying it's perfect, not saying it's even right. You know, like I look at my own life, I'm like, there's a lot of places that aren't exactly right. And God's still with me um, and still for me and still trying to help me in the middle of it. So, yeah, man, music and then just don't be a, a butthead to people. <laughs> I can think of it. Carrying Christ <laughs> in not my music and head. not being a butthead. Yeah, that could be the new carry Christ, you know, the, the subheader. Carry Christ, <laughs> don't be a butthead. Don't be a butthead. Yeah. <laughs> Corey, thank you for, thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks for letting us crash in your piano yeah, room in here. Art room, man. In the art room, yeah. yeah. And thanks for, I thanks for being honest. Mm. I, I love talking to you because I think mm. I, I'm always, I'm always aware that you're going to give us um, just honesty. I think you're doing, I think as a friend who we don't get to spend a lot of time together, mm. but I think mm. you're doing a, a spectacular job Thanks, man. of carrying Christ Thanks. to people. I think it's, it's coming through in your music and your kindness. So yeah, appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Boom. Enjoy that. Thank you for joining us today on the Redeeming Missions podcast. If you like what you heard, we encourage you to visit everyhome.org slash redeeming missions to find all past episodes and learn more about every home and joining the efforts to carry Christ to everyone, everywhere, in every generation. Echoing in the prayer of St. Patrick, Christ with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us. Let us carry Christ to our world. Until next time, 